Hi there, my name's Simon Drew and welcome to the Practical Stoic Podcast. Now, many of you will know the guest that we have on the show today. He's an absolute powerhouse within the Stoic community. His name is Donald Robertson. And I got him on the show because I wanted to discuss with him uh, basically what Stoicism can help us to understand about modern psychology and psychotherapy, because there are a lot of links there, and he's even written a book on it uh, about how Stoicism is the basis uh, for modern cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, But I want to uh, give you a bit of a background for Donald, because he's got a really interesting uh, background. Uh, And then we'll jump straight into the interview. So um, Donald Robinson, he is a cognitive behavioral therapist. He's a writer and also a trainer. Uh, He's the author of six books now on philosophy and psychotherapy. Uh, The latest book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor, the Stoic Philosophy of Marcus Aurelius, was recently reviewed by the Wall Street Journal and is now a number one bestseller in philosophy throughout the United States. So, Donald, congratulations. That's a huge achievement. Uh, And absolutely, everybody, I'm going to chuck the link to where you can buy that book in the show notes. So, make sure you go out and get that and support Donald because he really is thinking deeply about stoicism and philosophy and he's got so much to share. Uh, Now, Donald is from Scotland originally, but now he is a Canadian citizen living in Toronto. Uh, He's been writing and lecturing about Stoicism for roughly 25 years now, so he's really got a background of knowledge in in this philosophy. And he's also one of the founding members of the Modern Stoicism Organization, a non-for-profit responsible for Stoic Week and Stoicon, uh, the international conference. So again, such an incredible person, always giving of his time. We're grateful to have him here. I'm going to put the show notes, uh, sorry, a link in the show notes to where you can buy his new book, How to Think Like a Roman Emperor. Make sure you grab that. Uh, But without any further ado, I present to you my interview with Donald Robertson. I guess I'll start the conversation by by saying, you know, I reached out to you and I said, I'd really love to talk about specifically how stoicism kind of stacks up against our modern understanding of, of psychological theory and practice. And and you being a cognitive behavioral therapist for, for a lot of your life, I thought you'd be the man for the job to kind of discuss this with us. And I don't want to just say, hey, you know, do you think that it does stack up? Because I imagine that the answer is probably going to be, you know, there's a lot of yes and maybe there's some no as well. Um, but yeah. but but what what do you think? Like what what do you think of the main? Uh, I guess no. I'm just going to let you. I'm going to let you dive in and and just tackle that question for me. How it does stack up against our modern understanding? Well, we were just talking before we we went on air, as it were, about mm. misconceptions of stoicism, and I think that's a good place to start. Mm. And actually, nowadays, over the years, I've I've come to to start this discussion really in the same very simple place. And then everything else, I think, has to be based off that. Yeah. And it's that there are many words that we use in the English language today that are derived from Greek philosophy and have lost their meaning over time. Mm. So Epicureanism today means enjoying fine food, whereas the Epicurean philosophy in ancient Greece meant enjoying very simple and very plain food. It was almost the polar opposite mm. of fine dining and things like that. And likewise, cynical or being a cynic, the ancient philosophy meant something quite different from what cynicism means today. Mm. Academic, skeptic, soft, sophist, like a lot of these words change the meaning over time, right? And to distinguish between the two, often academics, writers in general, will capitalize one and write the other in lowercase, right? And so Mm. when we're talking about stoicism, there's a difference, a difference in meaning between Stoicism with capital S and lowercase stoicism. So lowercase stoicism has come to mean a personality trait or a Mm. style of coping which involves suppressing or concealing unpleasant or embarrassing emotions. Sounds Mm. like a dictionary there for a minute, but that's that's essentially (laughs) what it means, right? So it means having a stiff upper lip is what stoicism has come to mean. And all over the internet, people confuse that with Stoicism with a capital S, the Greek philosophy, mm. which obviously one's just a kind of way of coping with feelings. There's 
an entire school of philosophy that flourished for five centuries. So it's much bigger, much more complex, much more nuanced, and it formed the basis of modern cognitive behavioral psychotherapy. Mm. And there is some overlap. So the, these ideas are kind of connected, sort of tenuously connected. The, the lowercase one's a sort of caricature of the other one. Mm. But in some cases, what people mean by being stoic would be directly in conflict with the ancient Stoics' much more nuanced view about how to cope with our emotions. So that's mm. the first thing. And I say that, like, if you want to get right into research, right, it's well known in the field of modern health research and psychology that Stoicism with a lowercase s is a bad thing, right? Mm. Because there are many studies that show that it has negative psychological and emotional consequences as a style of coping, as mm. we phrase it, it's a quote, what we call a coping style. So there's, a, for example, a questionnaire called the Liverpool Stoicism Scale. There are other questionnaires that are used to measure attitudes, such mm. as like relating to, to people concealing or suppressing their emotions. And we know that generally, uh, you know, for example, that might prevent someone with a, f a physical illness from seeking help from their doctor or sharing their emotions with their loved ones and things. Mm. So we know that it's quite an unhealthy style of coping. And sometimes that confuses researchers. So we were talking earlier about, you know, talking to neuropsychologists and, and maybe talking to psychotherapists and so on. But you also have to be just as careful when you're talking to experts mm. as when you're talking to laymen, because often many of the experts, are, are they're just as likely to confuse these two concepts. Mm. So a lot of experts will say, but we've got research that shows stoicism is a really unhealthy thing. So why are all you guys suddenly reading books about Marcus Aurelius? Mm. And you have to say, well, hang on and back up a bit. Those are two completely different things. They just happen to sound the same. Yeah, they're homonyms. Like they, they, they're just words that are spelt the same. But one of mm. them means a school of philosophy, and the other one is just having a stiff upper lip. Mm. So, um, what the Stoics? Act, well, we get. Let's get into what the Stoics actually do. Say, there's more nuanced yeah. approach, right? So the way I would explain it, and this is a, bit, a little bit of a simplification, but it's the easiest way I can think to explain what the Stoics actually say about emotion. The Stoics say there are three types of emotion, good, mm. bad, and indifferent types of emotion. Right. So we know the Stoics distinguish between the good, the bad, and the indifferent in general. And normally when people talk about emotions, they're focusing on, on what the Stoics say about bad emotions, like pathé, um, which is the... What confuses people partly is the translation, because by a quirk of the Greek language, they use this word to mean emotion, and, and by that also the, the, the Greeks included what we would call desires. Hmm. So they, they are meaning, their word um, pathos is, is both broader in some respects and narrower in, in other respects than our word emotion would be. Hmm. So it, it doesn't map neatly onto our language of emotion. Um, it's also the word that's the root of our word pathology. So it can mean both mm. emotion and suffering or disease yeah. in Greek. And they sometimes use it broadly to refer to all emotion, colloquially. But sometimes they also use this word specifically to refer to unhealthy or irrational emotions. And that's what the Stoics are talking about. Mm. And it, sometimes even scholars, even very eminent scholars, have misread the Stoics as talking about emotion in general and the extirpation or the uprooting of emo all emotions. Mm. But in fact, they're really talking about uprooting negative, irrational, excessive, and unhealthy emotions as they mm. themselves phrase it. And mm. they make it clear, particularly Cicero makes it clear when he's commenting on the Stoics, that these are, Cicero plays with the idea of translating this word into Latin as disease or suffering um, mm. or uh, perturbation um, rather than emotion because he says that, that, that that's that's what they mean in Greek. It's just a bit of a quirk of the language that it's difficult to translate or confusing. Mm. So they talk about these unhealthy emotions, and then they distinguish those from eupatheiae, or healthy or good emotions. Mm. So those would be rational, moderate, uh, or not excessive, um, natural, um, healthy emotions. The, the wise man has, so the sage has these. And so they <clears> want to replace the unhealthy emotions with the healthy ones, hmm. right? Not just remove all emotion. Can I ask one and question here? There are, yeah. Sorry, I just want to jump in. So would it be right to say then that pretty much all emotions can either be unhealthy and irrational or 
healthy and rational uh, or not not all emotions but most emotions could be one or the other depending on how you approach them well that's actually what i was going to go into next is the indifferent yeah, cool. emotions mm. so there are three categories mm. and again this is where the, the translation becomes difficult just as an aside one of the areas where it's hardest to translate one language into another mm. is when you're discussing emotion yeah. So if you're talking about medium-sized dry goods, like a table, a chair, or whatever, mm. usually translation's fairly easy from mm. one language to another. But when you're talking about emotion, it becomes complicated because the terminology that the ancient Greeks used for emotion doesn't map directly mm. onto the yeah, terminology okay. that that we necessarily use today. Um, and so they, they also talk about what they call propathei, which is translated as proto passions or precursors of emotion mm. or the initial movements of emotion. And Seneca gives us a bunch of examples of these like blushing, shaking, sweating, trembling, um, you know, and he even replies it to anger. So the initial kind of feeling that precedes anger of irritation mm. or rage welling up. Now, the best way I can think of explaining this is that these are involuntary emotional responses they are automatic. They're not up to us, as Epictetus said. And therefore, um, as as the Stoics say themselves, the wise man accepts them as indifferent. So he doesn't mm. view them as negative things. He doesn't struggle against them or try and suppress them. He doesn't try and encourage or cultivate them. He just views them in a detached manner, just as a natural physiological phenomenon. There's a really good anecdote in a, a, a Roman writer called Aulus Gellius that explains this beautifully. It's just a shame it's not in the main sort of canon of Stoic texts. Mm. But you know, maybe I'll, I can tell you about that later. But there's a little story that he tells, an anecdote that perfectly sums up that this key, crucial point in mm. Stoic psychology. So everything falls into kind of healthy or unhealthy emotions. But then there's also these kind of emotions that because they're not under our direct control or just to be shrugged off as is indifferent and another way of explaining that now i'm going to a slightly different topic right mm. the another fundamental aspect of what the stoics say about emotion that many people get confused by in our culture we take for granted a platonic theory of emotion it's mm. implicit in our whole way of talking about emotion, where we distinguish reason and the passions as two separate faculties. Mm. So when you're talking to people on the internet or psychologists, they often view emotion this way, right? But the Stoics said that's wrong. Like they argued that reason and emotion are intertwined. They're really two different aspects of the same thing. Mm. And that when we have passions like anger, the Stoics said it's not just a feeling. Anger is also a cognitive attitude. So anger is an attitude that says you've broken, you've done something wrong, buddy. Like you've done something really wrong. Mm. Like and so it said it's difficult to genuinely be angry with somebody without also having this attitude or belief that's a value judgment, which might mm. be mistaken, right? And this was absolutely integral. Like this was rediscovered in cognitive therapy. Now, the Irrash the uh, propathei, the involuntary emotions, the Stoics might say we share with animals. Hmm. Like they're kind of physiological. So Seneca says, look, if somebody comes up behind you and goes boo, like you'll jump and you'll feel nervous, right? Your blood hmm. pressure might go up, your heart might st start beating faster. But so are you anxious or afraid? Well, you have a kind of involuntary anxiety response, but there's a sense in which it's not actually fully blown fear because you don't believe that you're in any danger. And mm. as long as you continue to believe that you're not in danger, it will just go away again naturally. Well, I, it, it's He compares it to someone poking you in the eye and you blinking automatically, mm. right? Um, but we tend to confuse this involuntary anxiety with the cognitive attitude of fear that mm. where we actually believe that we're in danger. And and so the, the two things tend to overlap and the, the boundary gets kind of blurred between them. So the Stoics say it's the cognitive emotions. It's the ones where there's an underlying belief that they want to change. And mm. they don't want to change them by suppressing them, but they want to change them by questioning whether the underlying belief is simply wrong, whether it's mm. mistaken or faulty, right? So the example I gave you earlier is if I was angry with you because I thought you'd insulted me behind my back, Hmm. And then I discovered that that was actually completely wrong. And I realized I just made the mistake. Maybe I, I realized I've mistaken you for somebody else. Hmm. Then my anger theoretically should dissipate naturally. I don't have a reason to be angry anymore. 
Mm. And maybe some of the feelings would continue, but the angry attitude can't as long as I accept that it, it, it's not true. As long as I genuinely accept that's a mistake, I can't really mm. have that belief that you've um, violated uh, a, a rule and, and uh, uh, committed an offence anymore. I've changed that. And so the, the, the physiological sensations should go away as well. And so the Stoics mm. are saying not that we should repress emotions, but we should challenge, question these underlying beliefs. And that's what would transform them into the healthy emotions. But these mm. kind of feelings that come and go, they say they, they're neither here nor there. Like we, we shouldn't be trying to repress or avoid them because that, that would actually imply that they're bad things. We should mm. be just shrugging them off with indifference, which is very... Then we get into the whole the whole realm of modern cognitive therapy because there are really two strands there and very brief i'll just tease that one is yeah, this definitely. whole idea about beliefs and that being the basis of everything we then do in cognitive mm. therapy yeah and then the other strand is this whole idea about acceptance of certain emotions and and that being a fundamental strand of modern cognitive therapy as well and maybe we can mm. we can dig further into what what the implications of that are, but that's basically a little lecture, if you like, about what the yeah. states actually say about emotion. Yeah, no, I love it. And that's what I'm trying so to do here with these conversations. It's, it's trying to tease out the, not necessarily what everybody thinks stoicism is, but what is the true essence of this philosophy and how it can, can kind of help people. And I wanted to ask, so, so, so we talk about, um, so it's not necessarily controlling emotions then, uh, it, in a way, you might be able to, to delve into this a little bit deeper. One thought that I've been having lately, which has been really, it's been a helpful way for me to approach the emotional side of stoicism and, and also for my clients who I work with, it's basically um, the idea that it's not about suppressing your emotions. It's not, and, and, and it's not going to happen. If you think you can just walk in and all of a sudden you can crush your anger, crush your, you know, sadness, crush everything that, you know, is, is in you right now, just naturally popping up. It's not going to happen, but if you look at it as more of a negotiation between your rational side uh -huh. of, of uh, I guess, like this is what you want to be living like and, and your emotive side, which is just naturally popping up. Like, and so if you all do right. have that anger that comes up and, and all of a sudden you're, you're just furious with your friend or something like that, maybe it's more of a negotiation between yourself and that anger and saying, well, let's stop and look at you for a moment. Let's have a discussion about yeah. where you're coming from, why you're here, what do you want from me, um, and is that a good um, and and virtuous, uh, I guess, pathway that you're taking us down? Um, is that similar to how you see it? As in, like, it's 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 actually. Let me frame the question like this: I did hear you say that stoicism is a long-term solution to uh, to mm. I guess reprogramming your mind is, is probably the cheesy, um, you know, personal development version of saying it, but is mm -hmm. that the way you look at it? Like a long-term sort of, mm -hmm. you might say a negotiation between you and your emotions, trying to get them into a place where they're more good than bad. I'll give you all my cliches. Stoicism's for life. It's not just for Christmas. Yeah. You yeah. know, it's, uh, <laughs> Are we saying research, the weird phrase that researchers and, and clinicians like to use is that stoicism is sticky. Mm. And by that, they mean it's um, uh, like uh, one of the big problems in, in training psychological skills is that people do them and then they, they work and then they forget about them and mm. revert back to what they were like before. Right. And so stickiness is when you teach someone a skill and they do it for the rest of their life or yeah. for a long time, at least. Right. And the idea is, like, if you teach people CBT skills, they're not as sticky as they could be. Like, mm. they, they work really well, but then a year later, maybe people have just kind of forgotten to do them and they've gone back to their old habits. Whereas stoicism seems to be stickier because it's almost like a religion or it's a philosophy of life. So it's something people kind of identify with more deeply. Mm. And they, they kind of immerse themselves in it more than they would with CBT. You know, like if you take the best selling CBT books, like one of the older ones, like David Burns is feeling good. Like not many people would read it more than once, I think. Um, and not that many. No, you don't see quotes from it plastered all over the Internet. And I've never met anyone with it tattooed on their arm or anything mm, like that. Yeah. Right. Whereas people get, uh, you wouldn't believe how many people I've met who have got Marcus Aurelius tattoos and <laughs> yeah. like, um, you know, like they, they, they read the meditations over and over again and they, you see quotes all over the internet. Um, mm. because, so there's a big, that's important, that matters. The very first book I ever wrote in Stoicism, I talked about how that matters to cognitive mm. therapists. That's the holy grail of, 
of psychotherapy in a way because people are like to put it crudely i mean people are really into this stuff mm. and they they embrace it more deeply and more permanently than they would with cbt and that's a big deal because it speaks to its longevity yeah. and you know like you were you were saying it the the trick is so cognitive therapy is remedial right mm. it's therapy and that means that for various historical and professional reasons it's mainly a, a time-limited treatment for specific diagnosable conditions. That's mm. not exclusively, um, but that's primarily how it evolved, right? So people reach a certain level of diagnosis, and then they're given a treatment protocol that's tailored for that specific problem, and mm. it should uh, only last maybe like two or three months, and then it should stop, although there may be um, things that they do to maintain improvement, like that basically it ends when they, they no longer meet a certain level of severity or diagnosis. Mm. Um, whereas stoicism, so like the, the holy grail though of any type of health research is prevention is better than cure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And stoicism has the potential to be more of a preventative, or we sometimes say prophylactic approach rather than a remedial or therapeutic mm. approach. So, we do CBT when someone already has a diagnosable problem. They're already anxious or depressed, severely so, and mm. then we do CBT. Now, there are versions of CBT that are meant for milder, what we sometimes call subclinical problems, or for coaching, for example. And there mm. are also preventative training approaches like the Penn uh, University uh, Resilience Program that Martin Seligman created and other resilience mm. training programs that are kind of connected to CBT, partly based on it. Um, but the main bulk of CBT is this kind of remedial clinical therapeutic approach. Yeah. Um, and so stoicism holds promise as a resilience or a preventative training where stickiness would be much more important. Hmm. So you can see if someone's already depressed um, and you do CBT with them, you might think, well, as long as they're not like severely depressed or suicidal, you know, several months later, then our work here is done. You yeah, know, and we can do some kind of maintenance stuff, but they don't need to come to weekly sessions and keep doing all the mm. thought records and everything anymore. Um, whereas, you know, like stoicism is like about improving your character, a so that you'll be flourishing more in life in general. Mm. So it's more kind of like a positive psychology type approach in that respect, but also so you're going to be more emotionally robust and less prone to developing anxiety and depression in the future. And then it's more like what we would call a form of resilience training. Mm. Uh, but for that to work, it, it, it has to last. One of the problems with standard resilience training is that research shows it works, for example, if you train, train a bunch of school kids to mm. use cognitive therapy techniques and problem-solving skills and mindfulness and stuff. But then if you follow up like one or two years later, like most of them will stop doing it. And mm. so it kind of prevents future mental health problems but you'd have to keep doing refresher courses which is expensive yeah. and time consuming right um so you've got a cost benefit thing you have mm. to work can we afford to do this like, on an annual basis for all these kids whereas stoicism possibly once you get it started people like continues you know uh, like more of its own like you know people are more likely just to identify with it and keep doing it mm. without having to keep having refresher courses arguably we don't know we haven't tested that yet we're just mm. beginning to kind of scratch the surface of that. But I think that's the hope for stoicism's mm. potential. Do you think that that could speak to some sort of, uh, I'm trying to, trying to think how to phrase this, some sort of inbuilt biological need for our belief system to be based around something that has a religious aspect, like something that is is not just a quick fix, but something that is a long term solution <clears throat> that we would have to adhere to, if if we are to mm. measure up. I, I I don't know quite how to how to phrase that, uh, but I know that it's very much a a topic of discussion, um, especially lately in society, um, and I've heard a lot of de interesting debates about whether or not to throw out the institution of religion and what that would do to humanity. And is there any room for stoicism to be, I don't want to sound like I'm trying to become the evangelical stoic preacher, <laughs> but, but uh -huh. uh, I hope you see what I'm, what I'm, where I'm coming from. Like the religious yeah. aspect of stoicism, what, what, how important is that? Well, I guess the way that I'd have to respond to that would be to say, you know, define religion 
Mm, so we, we'd have yeah. to say, well, what do we mean by religion in this context? So you're talking about actually worshiping Zeus, right? Presumably well, well, not. Well, what I mean, like, what, or... no, what I mean is, is, is the religious behavior of, okay, you get up every morning uh-huh. and you pray, or you get up every morning and you do a stoic journal where you're, you know, thinking about your, th- like, just, just like Marcus Aurelius would have done, like very religiously every single day, writing thoughts down about right. how he can improve, how he, how, he, you know, if that makes sense. I would take it in a different direction, actually. I mean, like you, mm. so it definitely benefits people to have a kind of routine like that, that they stick that, to. That's it. But then I think you can view that in a completely secular way, right? I don't, mm. I don't, you can say, it's a routine, but it's secular. It doesn't have to be religious in any sense. Mm. Um, but what, what I think you're, you're touching on maybe um, is a hot topic in modern clinical research, particularly in the treatment of depression, mm. which is, I'll just think of an easy way to explain this. Um, it's a, there's a distinction that modern behavioral psychologists make between um, what you might call extrinsic and intrinsic values right Mm. so it's a question about the nature of our fundamental values in life and um the 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 research and the the treatment protocols recently suggest the the, a better way to treat depression i mean in the past with depressed clients cognitive therapists like beck used to get people with depression to make a list of things that were pleasurable Mm. activities and then to kind of make a schedule to make more time to do things that gave them pleasure. And then cognitive therapists kind of realized, or behavioral psychologists realized that was a very superficial way of understanding what the opposite of depression would be and what Mm. what a fulfilling life would be like. And they started to argue, like, maybe, much like the Stoics, sounding eerily like the Stoics, they they said, maybe it's not about feelings of pleasure. Maybe Mm. it's about the awareness that you're living in accord with your fundamental values so Mm. for one of we don't even quite have the language to articulate this in english but more like for want of a better word what i would call a sense of fulfillment rather Mm. than a feeling of pleasure or subjective happiness so like for depressed people what they're they're really lacking isn't you know the kind of pleasure that you get from eating chocolate or having sex Mm. or something that that in the sense it just makes you gives you a temporary buzz or whatever it's more like a sense of meaning and a sense of satisfaction and a sense of purpose like mm. and that kind of contentment or satisfaction that comes at arguably a much deeper and more cognitive level yeah. feeling that you're living uh, in symmetry with your own values and that's what stoic virtue is like mm. the whole concept of virtue and stoicism is intrinsic value it's a character of your your quality and um, mm. a quality of your character rather in your actions rather than kind of external things that you may or may not succeed in, in achieving. And and so, like, I mean, modern behavioral therapy for depression asks people to engage in really a philosophical um, U-turn or conversion and, and change in a, actually a meta-ethical way, in a really deep, fundamental way to change their whole way mm. of thinking, not just about what sort of values they have, but about the whole nature of value itself. Hmm. actually it's quite a radical thing um and you know the the stoics were saying exactly the same thing to put it very simply to really simplify the message Hmm. the stoics said look you you're born you go out into the world you look around you and you see people running around after money Hmm. and sex and reputation like and all of the external trappings of fame and uh, success in the world and you think I guess that's what must matter in life. Yeah. And everybody talks as if it does, and you start to copy them, and you start to talk and think like them. Mm. But when you actually reflect on it very deeply, the Stoic said any one of us should be able to realize that these things are merely a means to an end. Money in itself is just a piece of paper. Right? Mm. It's worthless. It's trivial. Like What matters is how you use it. Mm. Right? You can use money to do terrible things, like you, you know, dictatorial, oppressive, vicious things. Like you could blow it all on crack cocaine. Mm. Like, or you could use it, you know, to do really philanthropic and rewarding and fulfilling mm. things that give you a sense of purpose and, and life satisfaction. So the money in itself is kind of merely a crutch. Like it's merely a means to an end. So you really, you need to be asking yourself, what's the point of all of this stuff? Like mm. why, 
you know, are you pursuing reputation and fame and external success and wealth and stuff? What was it you're trying to actually get out of it? And the Stoics would say, ultimately, it, it, it's enlightenment. Like, it's uh, Sophia, phronesis, like mm. it's moral wisdom. It was their argument. And they, the, the Stoics really just echo what Socrates said. They're, they're very much Socratics in that respect. Mm. You know, uh, Socrates in the Euthydemus says, define good fortune. And his interlocutor says, look, this is a no-brainer question, Socrates, right? Like most of the questions Socrates begins by asking, it seems like a rhetorical question. He's like, well, good fortune means having wealth and success and noble birth and having lots of friends and status in society. Everybody mm. knows that. And then Socrates goes on to say, but all of these things could be used badly. Mm. By... And his conclusion then is that these things are merely opportunities and what matters, like a, a good and wise man will use wealth and reputation to do wise and good things. And a vicious mm. and foolish person will, will use them to do vicious and foolish things. So his conclusion is it, it can only be moral wisdom that makes these other things good and worth having. And it can only be vice and folly that makes them negative or dangerous or harmful mm. in life. It's the use we make of the matters. And the Stoics said, like, the point of the Stoics and following on from Socrates is that we're all ignorant of this mm. like we because we look at other people and see what they're doing on the outside and we're duped into thinking that the goal of life is to get all this external stuff and we all naturally have this kind of natural as you said a minute ago almost a physiological or mm. hardwired ingrained genetic predisposition to forget the meaning of life to forget that the goal of life is eudaimonia mm. or the kind of fulfillment that comes from living wisely mm. um, and in accord with our, our, our fundamental values and preserving the integrity of, of reason um, so we can see the, these things clearly. But modern therapists have rediscovered this and they say, look, in depression, we can't just be telling people make a list of things that like make you feel happy and that are pleasurable. Mm. Yeah. You know, so what would you be doing? Like, you're just going to sit and masturbate and eat chocolate all day and like, you know, play video games. Like, you know, there's yeah. definitely something wrong with this. We're looking yeah. at it. You, you need to dig deeper. You need to dig deeper and identify the things that are actually going to make you. The way that I would explain it, uh, in line, more in line with the Sto what the Stoics would say, is it's almost more a question of what would make you proud of yourself. Mm. So, what would give you self esteem and allow you to be able to, whereas you're laying your head down to sleep at night, look back on what you've done during the day and feel a sense of satisfaction. And actually like yourself as a person. Yeah. Like yeah. they talk about, you know, the, the, the fool is alienated from himself. He'd, Marcus Aurelius at one point says, Why would you listen to the criticisms or the opinions of people that don't even approve of themselves? Mm. And so his assumption is that vicious and foolish people are at odds with themselves. They're conflicted, like they're dis disintegrating psychologically. They don't even agree with their own values. Mm. Like, and he thinks that's all of us. We're all in this mess. Yeah. Right? But the wise man is more one of the words that Stoics like to use. One of their original definition of eudaimonia was living in agreement, and then they added with nature later. Mm. But the, the Greek word implies in a number of things, but in part it implies living consistently. Mm. I.e., when Socrates used to cross examine people and use the Socratic method, the alenkis we call it, um, his method of questioning which we still use a variation of in modern cognitive therapy. The word alenkis is the word that the Greeks would use for cross-examining a witness in court. But Socrates said we should do that to ourselves regarding our moral values. And his goal, he says, was to identify a sort of hypocrisy or mm. inconsistency in our thinking. And what's the outcome of that? Uh, once you've you really questioned yourself, Socrates and the Stoics think, is to have a more rounded and internally consistent worldview. Hmm. Where you're actually acting in a way that's that has integrity and is consistent with your genuine beliefs and values in life. Hmm. But prior to that, we're all liars and hypocrites, and we the, the life that we live is completely at odds with with what, on reflection, we, we would say is is the point of it all. Um, hmm. And they think we just need to sort this mess out. We've got into this mess because the society that we live in, and because this predisposition to be led astray by things that we see uh, going on around. It's a perennial problem. Mm. And they said the, the Stoics describe it as a epistrophe, a U-turn, like a conversion, 
we have to kind of mm. do this radical upheaval where we swim against the, the tide of society, dig deep and really ask ourselves what what the purpose of life is and then start living more consistently in accord with mm. that. And they thought of that as, as really requiring that the cynics, the predecessors, the Stoics symbolized this by walking backwards along the street. Um, or when people were coming out of a theater, they would walk into the crowd. And they did that partly to train themselves to be yeah. oblivious to criticism and embarrassment. Yeah. But it also symbolized their their whole philosophy of life. They said, we need to start to swim against the tide and do the opposite morally of what everybody else around us is, hmm. uh, seems to be doing. Like They all want money and fame and success and for everybody to like them and stuff. And we've got to shatter these mm. idols and start again from scratch and reconstruct a morality that, that's actually based on, on, on what's in our hearts mm. like, and the things that we, we, we genuinely value in life. Yeah, it, it definitely sounds like the Stoics may have been some of the earliest trolls in society, just <laughs> walking backwards. Yeah. And, yeah. But uh, you, you, oh, man, you've touched on so many really, really important things that I want to I discuss here. The, the first comment I'd make is you, you probably did define exactly what I was trying to talk about, which is it might not necessarily be um, a religious aspect of Stoicism necessarily in the metaphysical kind of, you know, theological way, but in many ways, somebody coming to Stoicism and transforming their life looks very similar to a religious experience in that there is that conversion and then there's that new dedication yeah. to seeing the world through a different shade, essentially. And and I think I think you probably just you you probably touched perfectly on. It, it might be easier for us to now define why it is that Stoicism has had such a resurgence in in our modern times, because I feel like we've been sold this bullshit lie <laughs> to yeah. pardon my friend of, of you can be happy you can have yeah. the house you want you can have the car that you want we've been marketed to for so long and pe and I'm, yeah. I'm seeing this in people people light up when you tell them the truth which is that you have extreme intrinsic value in you as an individual and you have so much more to give the world than just to go out there and get a car get a house you know like People want to know that life isn't just about happiness. It's about going out there uh -huh. and picking up massive responsibility and trying to align with nature, as you said, uh, or like, like you know, what's true, what's false, um, and, and to try and essentially uh, contribute to society in a meaningful way that possibly uh -huh. only you could do. Uh, could, could we possibly touch on that that idea of aligning with nature? Because that's... That's something yeah. that I have always run away from in Stoicism because I didn't understand it fully. But I'm, I think I'm only just starting to get there. And it's actually really exciting because it's something I want to talk about a lot more often. But I'll let you explain a little bit about what the Stoics mean when it, when it comes to aligning with nature. Well, the Stoics had this slogan that the goal of life was living in agreement with nature. Um, and in the original Greek, it's actually quite a sort of resonant, symbolic, kind of loaded. It's just a very short phrase, but it's, it's obviously partly it became a lasting slogan because um, mm. in the Greek, it, it's very rich in meaning and, and carries a lot of connotation. And the 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 Stoics interpreted it um, to mean a number of different things. Mm. So people often read it and think, what the hell does that mean? It's kind of cryptic. Mm. It meant a bunch of things to them, mm. which are kind of a little bit hard to translate into to English. Um, so, number one, the phrase they use implies living consistently, or you could say with integrity, or in mm. a way that where you're not being a hypocrite or or contradicting yourself. I, I as we mentioned, if you really use the Socratic method, you should like, expose all those contradictions and work them through. That's mm. one part of it. Another part is the it, the Chrysippus, the third head of the, the Stoa. Um, introduced this dichotomy between internal and external nature. Mm. And so the Stoics clearly believe, this is one of their recurring themes, is they go, on the one hand you have to do this, on the other hand you have to do that. Mm. Um, it's, that's the first sentence of the Stoic handbook of Epictetus. It says, on the one hand, some things are up to us, on the other hand, other things are not. This is uh, like an idiom in Greek as well. It's quite common. Mm. And so Chrysippus said there's internal and external nature. So internal nature um, would be, look, what's your fundamental nature as a human being? You, the Stoics often say 
if you want to know what it, the goal of life is, you have to first of all ask yourself, what what am I? Like mm. Marcus talks about this a lot. He says, you know, like who am I? What am I? Epictetus raises this question to his students as well. You know, are you like just an animal? Like, are you just like a bunch of organs, like in flesh and stuff? Mm. You know, what what's the core of your identity? And that what the Stoics want to argue is that the the core of your being is self consciousness and your ability to reason. Mm. You know, not necessarily like the reason maybe isn't quite the right word. Um, there, what they mean is this kind of broad um, ability to be self aware and use language and, yeah. and think in general, right? They don't just mean we're logic machines. They they mean something more like what what we would mean. What's more kind of common sense, if you like, the uh, what distinguishes us from other animals, and what's at least to some extent, and and what's really the core of our identity is is our ability to think and mm. and to exhibit self awareness. Um, so the Stoics might say, look, you know, you could imagine what would you rather lose your body or your mind. Like mm. if you could lose your body but carry on with the, the like the body of a robot but st- still have your mind intact, would you mm. rather have that or would you rather have like go insane and have your mind destroyed but your body continues? And they mm. think it's self-evident that most people would rather preserve their mind because that's what they identify with. Mm. Like you know they might not be keen to lose their body, but they they feel as if they kept the body but lost their mind, then they might as well be dead, mm-hmm. by, yeah. because they don't really exist anymore in a sense. So the Stoics said, look, you're not your body. You're, you're, you're your ability to think and reason. Hmm. And then they thought it follows from this that we have an obligation to use this part of our, our minds well. They thought, as reasoning animals, if you're going to reason or think at all about the world and speak, then you're implicitly committed to grasping the truth. Hmm. What's the point of thinking if you're if you don't care whether what you're thinking is true or false hmm. right so the stoics would argue you're implicitly committed to thinking well thinking successfully thinking hmm. clearly and grasping the truth and they think like essentially you can deduct a whole ethic from this right if you believe that we're already necessarily committed to this project of grasping the truth then all you have to do is just do that properly that's your job and like mm. you do have a job, you do have a duty, and it's to achieve wisdom. What would it mean to take this ability to think and do it properly? Well, that would be, for want of a better word, what we call wisdom. It would be a mm. kind of practical wisdom, a moral wisdom. It would be thinking clearly applied to life. So the Stoics call the goal of life living rationally mm. or living wisely. Their mm. attempts to try and articulate this. So living in agreement with nature means thinking and acting consistently and without hypocrisy, and also grasping that your essential nature is your ability to think and reason and applying that to the best of your ability so that you begin to approach a kind of wisdom. And then mm. the other, the flip side of it is external nature. Yeah. So the Stoic said, look, and we're in this environment where a bunch of stuff happens that's not under our direct control. Mm. Like, and a lot of it we can influence, but we don't have direct control, complete control over any of it. There are two things in the world, as Epictetus would say. There's the stuff that you're doing, and then the stuff that's happening to you, mm. simply. There are your actions and your experiences. like The stuff that you do voluntarily, that you could choose to stop doing, and then there's all the other stuff. Mm. Like what's up to us and what's not up to us. And the Stoics say the things that aren't up to us, we have to realize lack intrinsic value. They're merely a means to an end. We have to begin to view them uh, in a more neutral manner, their values being more derivative. Mm. Like, and what's really important is the way that we use our own actions. So we should take more responsibility for our voluntary actions in life and our voluntary thoughts in life and learn to be more detached and different and accepting mm. towards external nature, like the stuff that's happening to us. And, and Chris, Chris Ipus illustrated this with this famous anecdote, famous metaphor of the dog and cart, mm. like, and they, that everyone seems to love. Um, but it's a pretty cool metaphor. So the idea is there's a car, which I guess this would have been a common thing in ancient Greece, mm-hmm. and there's a dog tied to it. 
and this uh, the dog he says look the car is like fate or it's external nature it's the stuff that happens mm. and he says either you go with the flow or you're dragged along by it anyway so either the dog kind of mm. like what has learned just to walk along and keep pace you know and after it's been doing it for he goes you'll see someone with a dog in the cart and the dog manages to walk perfectly in sync with the car like they're mm. two kind of fluid things or, you know, like at first someone gets a new dog and he ties it to his cart and he sets off and the dog's being dragged along by its backside. Mm. Like it hasn't figured out yet how to, how to keep pace with the cart. And he says the fool or the vicious man is always at odds with the external uh, events. He's kind of str- he's frustrated. He wants to deny them. He goes, I can't believe this is happening to me. Mm. Like, why me? Like, and he complains about everything. And he says the wise man accepts everything that befalls him in the sense, not that he agrees with it, but that he accepts reality. Mm. So he doesn't say, I can't believe this has happened to me. He says, c'est la vie, stuff like this happens. And then maybe he does something about it. But he doesn't mm. grumble and complain and get frustrated with the fact that it's happened. Too late mm. for that. Like, he accepts reality and then seeks to move forward. So it's not passive. They seek to reconcile commitment to disciplined action with a kind of emotional acceptance of things that have already happened or are otherwise beyond their direct yeah. control. Yeah, and I, I, I love what you're saying there because it, it goes back to, again, what we were talking about earlier where it's somewhat of a negotiation between what you can control and what you can't. It's like it would be wrong to just go by life being dragged along by everything that we can't control, uh, but it would also be wrong to think that we can control everything. There has to be kind of like a like a middle ground there where you try to better your circumstances whilst also recognizing that there are a lot of things that you can't necessarily uh, better or at least immediately. But could we talk about like with, with your own practice, like how do you bring this back to the modern practice of, of, of psychological I don't know, um, methods? How do you get people to align with nature and understand the things that they can't control and the things that they can and how do you get them to really like perfectly align with that and, and see the value in it well that's a very big question because the way yeah. that you would do these <laughs> things in practice is actually quite diverse like so for example mm. i'll give you an example like of how diverse it is when I wrote my first book on Stoicism, I, I reviewed all of the psychological techniques that I could find in the Stoic literature, and I compared mm. them to techniques that I found in modern cognitive therapy. And then I, I never numbered them, but I went back uh, not a few years ago and had another look at it, and I thought, I'll count them. And there were about 18 mm-hmm. distinct psychological strategies that the Stoics mentioned. And that's mm. aside from the fact that those each one of those might be applied in a number of different ways. When you're working with a real person, you might do a combination of those things. So there's a whole, in a sense, there's like a, a whole complex variety of things mm. that you might do with an individual. But um, like I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example maybe that, that helps a bit. My, my specialism is treating anxiety disorders. Mm. And... Uh, I'll give you. I'll tell you a little story about how this would apply in practice to anxiety, because sure. it might not be obvious at first. And we didn't talk a lot about modern cognitive theories of emotion, but this will kind of touch on that. So this brings us mm. right back round to to where we started in a sense, right. where we were talking about the theory of emotion. So, I'll, let's start off with a simple slogan, if you like. I would happily stick my neck out and say, from years, decades of experience of working with people with anxiety disorders, that in a word, um, the, a fundamental aspect of most anxiety is that people blur the boundary between what's under their control and what isn't, mm. and that they don't take enough responsibility for aspects of their anxiety that are under their voluntary control, mm. and they try too hard to struggle with and control aspects of their anxiety that are involuntary and not under mm. their direct control and let me i'll explain exactly what i mean by that right and this, this is how we work in modern cbt anyway right so say somebody has generalized anxiety disorder or, or gad and they, they we call that pathological worrying the worrying mm. disorder um so what they'll typically do is they get anxious and there'll be physiological symptoms of anxiety. 
So they'll get tension headaches. They will feel the body tense up, their neck muscles ache and mm. stuff. They get back aches or tense and stuff. Um, they have problems sleeping. Um, maybe they get stomach ache or other physical pains. Maybe mm. they're even sweating. Maybe the hands sweat or something. Um, maybe they shake like because they get really anxious and maybe this is a more complicated one but they may feel that the heart rate's increasing although actually it doesn't mm. often but like so they they have these physical sensations of anxiety and so what most people will do then is to go i must stop my hands from shaking i must stop mm. my heart from beating so fast um, i must do something about this headache or relax all this tension away in my neck and so they tend to become more preoccupied than would be natural for years every day for hours with their own body and mm. physiological sensations that are going so their attention becomes very narrowly focused what we call threat monitoring it mm. becomes very focused on on these symptoms and it becomes narrowed down in scope and okay so they, it's unnatural like they become quite focused on that and, and would and you define that they, as the external nature that they're dealing with there like yeah yeah cool yeah. these are when we say external just to qualify a term mm. In stoicism, we do not mean external to your body. We mean external mm. to your prohoresis or mm. um, external to your volition, if you like, external to your will. Yeah. External in stoic psychology just means involuntary. Yeah. Uh, it means what's external to your will. So what's involuntary? Yeah. It's avolitional. Um, so that would include stuff that's going on in your body, right? So these things aren't under voluntary control. People will try and relax really hard. They'll try and ignore them. They'll just get annoyed about them. They'll wish that they weren't experiencing them. Mm. And that's toxic for a bunch of reasons, right? So first of all, it creates a very unnatural style of thinking that is mm. pretty much pretty sticky, it's permanent. Like, so people become very wrapped up in their own thoughts and in their own body and quite distracted from what's going on in, around them in life. Mm. Their attention becomes quite narrowed in scope and, it, and they engage in a lot of catastrophic thinking. And, and for example, like the insane circularity of this, like if you've got tension headaches and back pain and stuff because of excessive worry and, and what you do in response to that is to focus on it even more. Mm. And we know that a natural consequence of focusing really intensely for long periods on your muscles is that they tend to tense up more. Mm. So the thing that you're doing to try and cope with these involuntary feelings is probably making them even worse. This is yeah. a recurring thing in, in, in therapy. We usually find that the things people do to cope with problems, often like just chucking petrol on a, a fire, like making yeah. it even worse, day after day after day for years, right? Mm. Um, so they're like, I have to stop, I have to relax or whatever, and they're just making themselves more and more tense, right? So a stoic would say, maybe these sensations are neither here nor there, right? They're neither good nor bad. They're just stuff that's happening to mm. me. Like, and I shouldn't fall into the trap of getting angry with them or being afraid of them because they're not that important in life. Mm. What matters more is the way that I'm actually responding to them, right? So a stoic would learn to accept these things with, to view them as natural and inevitable and neither good nor bad but indifferent and to refrain from complaining or getting annoyed about them, mm. right? So viewing them with a kind of mindful detachment, basically. So that's what I mean by not struggling against things that aren't under your direct control. And then uh, what well, people who worry um, don't take enough responsibility for the voluntary aspects of anxiety. So they, they'll, if you ask people, we know from research in this area, if you ask people um, how much control do you have over your worrying, they'll usually say none. And so they generally they believe that worrying is involuntary. Mm. And they're wrong, mm -hmm. right? Because we know that the act of worried thinking, like the stuff that they say to themselves, um, the style of thinking is actually under voluntary control. And mm. so, but people don't realize that. They assume it's not. So they let it go on much longer than they normally should. So there's two types of thoughts. There are automatic thoughts that just pop into your head. But then there are voluntary thoughts that you have in response to those. Mm. So people kind of struggle to ignore or kind of suppress the involuntary thoughts, which is a waste of time and energy and just makes them worse. And then they allow the automatic, the, the voluntary part of the thinking to just run amok rather mm. than learning to control it, refrain from it. So an easy way to explain that, the easiest way to explain that would be to say to somebody, 
think of it in terms of the amount of time that you spend thinking about stuff. Hmm. So most people with chronic worry when they're lying in bed at night will will often have incipient insomnia, they'll have problems falling asleep, uh, they'll say they can't stop worrying about stuff and that keeps them awake. Whereas normally, we all worry, but most of us if we're getting bed at night and we have to get up early for work the next day and suddenly something pops into our mind, um, you know, I forgot to post a letter or what if this happens or what if that happens, we might think, I'll worry about that tomorrow because I need to get mm. to sleep now. So it's normal to postpone thinking about intrusive thoughts. And we're all capable of doing that. Mm. That's how most people get to sleep. They go, mm. think about that later. It's bedtime now. Right? Whereas people with chronic worry don't believe that they can do that. Mm. Um, they, either they believe it would be dangerous to do that and they're wrong or they don't even realize that they have that much control and they're wrong about that as well mm. like so they have to kind of relearn to take ownership for that style of thinking control over it so here we're not that um what i'm basically driving at here is that a lot of people mistakenly interpret the stoics as saying that we should distinguish between external stuff that's under our control and external stuff that isn't mm. and the real distinction that the stoics are making it would be better to say they want us to distinguish between our actions and stuff that happens to us or between mm. action and experience, right? Between the stuff that we have direct voluntary control over and everything else, mm. like everything else the Stoics think we need to accept isn't entirely under our control. And we only control other stuff through the medium of our actions anyway. So we need to realign our attention to focus on our locus of control Mm. Why and accept that other things are merely a consequence of that mm. rather than banging our head against a, a wall by focusing on the outcome and not focusing on the means of action if that mm. makes sense so we're, we're all it's like a magic trick you know where the magician has got your attention over here but actually what he, he's really doing is over here like anxiety is like that we're looking in totally the wrong direction mm. we're ignoring the bit here that we could easily just change and we're banging back for years people are banging their head against the wall like trying to to fix the outcome like over which they don't have complete control mm. and then doing nothing to change the bit that they actually have control over like yeah. and literally teaching that can, can change things within a, a day you know when people have the realization you know, realize that they've been duped by this kind of illusion like, and they kind of, you know, do a turnaround and, and realize where they should actually be focusing, focusing their attention. But the Stoics knew that two and a half thousand years ago. Mm. It, it sounds it sounds like what you're saying is is that there's a time for validating your feelings and then there's a time for invalidating your feelings and, and trying to essentially yeah. say, well, actually, I, I'd like to expand on an idea if that's okay, because um, it, we can, if, we, if we're talking about this in relationship to how the Stoics view nature and, and our place within nature. Something that my dad always used to say, which is really interesting thinking about it now um, with talking about Stoicism is that we grew up on a farm. And so if, if you leave the farm for a few weeks and then you come back, you'll see that nature is slowly creeping up trying to take over everything that has been built on the farm. So, you know, the grass will grow taller, yeah. the trees will grow bigger, you know, you're not pruning things and the vines will start growing up the house. And it's like, this could happen in a rainy season in the matter of literally weeks that nature just starts taking over everything that's been built. And so it seems mm -hmm. in nature, we already know that there's, there's essentially the idea of chaos and order that, that nature is just constantly mm -hmm. a battle between chaos and order and, and down to the human level, it's exactly the same in our own minds. It's like there's, it's like nature is, it's like if you allow the anxiety to creep in and try to take over you as in nature would do so if you left it unchecked for a while, what we're essentially doing is saying the rational side of us as human beings is what turns the chaos of nature into order or is what keeps our minds in line in a positive direction so that we don't allow nature to completely take over us in, in a way, or we don't allow our um, impulses to take over and, and completely destroy us in the long run, which you might say is a perfect example of what would happen if you were to just allow 
all of your anxious feelings to have the highest importance in your in your mind D- does that kind of make sense it's like it's kind of like not a battle but a, a, a discussion between the chaos and order of our own minds i'm not sure i would formulate it in those terms like mm. i i i kind of feel like that that way of framing it doesn't quite work but the the yeah, but please, you know yeah. for example i would say that there are aspects we'd, we'd want to distinguish between aspects of nature um which are under our voluntary control mm. uh, potentially um and aspect aspects that aren't so there would be mm. i guess in that analogy i would say look there's there's things there are, there are things in nature um that we just have to accept like mm. that are you know that we can't do anything about at all um and then there are things that we might be able to change as a consequence of our actions mm. but our actions themselves i suppose are, are part of nature um and our actions can sometimes initially seem kind of chaotic and irrational and so on mm. like we need to learn to expand our sphere of control and take greater responsibility for the things that are potentially up to us yeah. and then I guess really what the Stoics were, would be saying is, and it's not so much, I think, in a sense, it's about organizing things or giving them order, but a better way of framing it, I think, is simply like really the, the core of what they want us to do is to question our thinking, like the mm. philosophers at the end of the day. And I guess it all comes back to really the essence of philosophy and the Socratic method is to question our, our beliefs for inconsistencies and falsehoods. Hmm. Like, and you know you could say that what you end up there with then is a more orderly and organized way of looking at things but really the central focus of it is to seek out question inconsistencies and falsehoods in our worldview hmm. yeah yeah definitely no i love that and that that's kind of that's kind of where i i i see it um in terms of the chaos and order and 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 it, and I'm trying to formulate it in a way that that actually makes sense, but but in other words, um, when you think of somebody who is in a state of chaos, that to me, like when I see somebody like that, it's usually somebody who has very ill formulated opinions and beliefs. Um, you know, doesn't necessarily use rationality to uh, to I guess um, overcome those. Um, those what we might call the bad emotions or the emotions that have gone bad um and you know they immediately assent to every single impression that they have um you know that to me is Mm, in in some ways it's it's kind of a chaotic way to live life just accepting everything that 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 comes at you um and and acting off that as opposed to pausing in the moment and saying well how could i make a better decision in this in this case if that if that makes sense i guess the other reason i i I probably i'm not so inclined towards that way of framing Mm. things is it seems to me that what you're calling chaotic i i actually would see as quite orderly in some respects it's just Mm. wrong yeah right there's a way of you know there's a kind of logic and an order orderliness to it and especially if i look at clients in therapy Mm. Like they can talk all day about their reason, especially GAD clients mm. will talk all day about their <clears throat> logical justifications for believing crazy bullshit. Yeah. Right. So it's in us. And from one point of view, it's chaotic. From another point of view to them, it seems very orderly and, and, and super organized, mm. but it's false. And maybe at certain levels inconsistent. So you, mm. I guess it, whether you view it as orderly or chaos, partly is relative. It sort of views what perspective, it depends what, perspective you adopt on it part Mm. of the problem of framing it in that way though is that when you're talking to these people to them it often seems or any of us really like when we're a when when we're thinking crazy bullshit it usually seems pretty orderly Mm. and and organized to us so it might not uh, necessarily be challenged yeah it it might not be helpful to the person a lot of clients in therapy are very logically minded people right Mm. yeah it may may, that might not be the like the 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 best inroad if you like to 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 challenge it and get some leverage over it mm. i'm thinking of gad clients often think that they that they do have a, a very well thought through mm. like organized and also ocd clients like which are kind of similar in some ways might have a kind of very orderly and structured and organized way of uh, of doing things mm. um 
and might be quite frightened of chaos, um, but nevertheless have loads of false beliefs that are underlying mm. this organized worldview. So whether you consider it organized or, or, or disorganized would depend on your perspective, but the, the difficulty would be persuading them that I, it's not organized or orderly enough because to them it, you know, and in fact, in some respect, they, they they very much seem like they're they're kind of trying too hard to structure that mm. I, that opens a whole can of worms actually in modern psychology about rule following mm. and uh, the, the problematic aspects of of highly structured organized and, and rule following behavior but that's a mm. maybe another discussion another day yeah definitely no well i'm as you know as i said from the start i i want to have many more of these discussions but I think that that might be one of the reasons why stoicism can be so effective with these sorts of cases. It's because our emotions do seem extremely real on almost every single level, right? And and it's and to get somebody to see that there's a different way of framing the world than the one that they're currently uh -huh. in is, I mean, it's 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 incredibly difficult and we know that it's difficult because it's difficult to do with ourselves. Like, like for me, I've, I've, I've seen mm -hmm. over my life that, and, and I just tell my wife this now, I'm like, listen, if I'm thinking something that you think is probably an incorrect way to think, um, you can tell me all you like, but in the end, it's probably going to take me at least six to 10 months to fully, <laughs> to fully change. And, and I've changed my opinions and the way that I see the world on many, many different ways. Um, but it doesn't happen overnight because it, it's so difficult to look at yourself and, and be like, yeah, listen, that is absolutely incorrect and you need to change that because it's like from where you're standing, it looks so real and it looks so, um, so tangible. Um, is that, is that kind of mm -hmm. one of the big, not problems, but, but do you deal with this a lot with people really trying to delve into why they believe what they believe and how they see the world? And is it really difficult for people or do you find that because uh -huh. they've come to you, yeah. they're already ready to kind of make that change? Well, actually, see, actually I'm just I'm having a look at the time. We're probably going to have to wrap up in a second. Oh yeah. Sorry. But yeah. I apologize. The, um, it's, sorry, I've just, I know that I've got to, I've got another meeting. Oh, um, sorry. <laughs> well, we can, we so can I'm come back to this later if you like. Well, I can I can say very briefly. Like, there's a whole chapter in my in How to Think Like a Roman Emperor that's about this. Mm. Um, Galen, in particular, Marcus Aurelius's physician, talks about ancient philosophical therapy. He's drawing on books by Chrysippus about Stoic therapy, mm. and it, it, his his starting point is this idea that people have a blind spot for their own thinking errors, and he talks at great length about how in the ancient world you you kind of need to find somebody who will act as a mentor and and help mm. you identify those things. He 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 says a lot of interesting things about it, which I won't go into right now. But mm. he basically his starting point is to say, look, n like we nobody um, is really finds it easy to identify his own um, errors of thinking. We we mm. usually need someone else to point them out to us. Mm. Yeah. Well, look, I will. Uh, I'll let you get back to your day then, and and I just want to thank you so much, Donald. Seriously, this is an awesome discussion, and uh, right, as pleasure. I said. I want to have many more and maybe this will help us to uh, pick up next time yeah. when we start talking. We can get back into the mentorship side of things and yep. why it's important to have somebody point that out to you. But yeah, we could talk um, about that. I'll put all the links to your books in okay. the show notes um, and also I'll get you to send me a link of where people Great. can go if they want coaching from you or um, therapy from yeah. you as well. Very important. But Awesome. Thanks so much, John. Cool. Thank you very much. Cheers, then. All right, so there you have it, my interview with Donald Robertson. Now, again, Donald, thank you so much for coming on the show. And everybody, if you enjoyed this interview, make sure you reach out, buy his book, send him a message on social media, wherever he is, uh, and I'll put the links to where you can find him in the show notes as well. But uh, just let him know how much you enjoyed this interview uh, and we'd love to have him back many, many times. Uh, and again, look, if you're enjoying this podcast, if you're enjoying everything that you're hearing, hearing here, Make sure you jump on my Patreon site and support me there. Uh, it would mean a lot to me and it keeps this show going so that we can keep on getting amazing people like Donald on the show. 
Uh, and as soon as you subscribe to me on Patreon, you will get access to over 200 episodes that I did of this podcast between 2017 and 2020. So make sure you jump on there as well. But apart from that, thank you so much for listening to the show and I'll talk to you next time. But until then, I hope that this episode has helped you on your rise to the good life. Ciao. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Practical Stoic Podcast. If you'd like to stay up to date with the Practical Stoic community and everything to do with this podcast, then just go to my website, simonjedrew.com and subscribe to the Practical Stoic Weekly, a newsletter that I send out every week with updates and all sorts of great Stoic insights. You can also find me everywhere online by searching Simon J.E. Drew. See you next time.